Well, let me add my uh, welcome to Karen's. It's great to be here this morning, isn't it, on this glorious Easter morning. Um, I don't know if Karen's already done this, because I was out first thing at the door, but I'm going to do it anyway. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Great. If you've ever spent any time with young children, you'll know that one of the brilliant things about toddlers uh, is their insatiable desire to learn. They seem to know almost instinctively that to, uh, to grow in their understanding and know things, the best thing is to ask questions, questions of people who know. So they ask their parents and other adults uh, in the uh, perhaps naive belief that they have answers for everything, uh, questions about everything. It's estimated that toddlers ask between 100 and 300 questions a day which means at a minimum that's 40,000 questions a year. Is it surprising that parents of young kids are exhausted and sometimes resort to just, just because? Roger Kipling wrote, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. If you want to know something, Ask someone who knows. Uh, 50 years ago, DJ Hayerson wrote, Be Your Own Gardening Expert. That book design cover has changed, hasn't it, over the years? Um, that was the first one he wrote. He actually wrote a whole series. I don't know if it, quite distinctive covers. I don't know if anyone's got any copies of these. Um, they're quite well known. Yes, a few nods. He's actually sold 50 million of them worldwide. So 50 million people knew that. In order to find what they didn't know, they needed to ask someone who did, ask an expert. Well, the Corinthian church had written to the Apostle Paul with a number of questions that they wanted answers to. Not, it won't surprise you to hear about gardening, uh, but about the Christian faith. They'd written to the Apostle uh, uh, for some answers, and this letter uh, includes his reply to some of them. And one of the questions they had asked Paul about was the resurrection. And what I want to do this morning, really, is in the short time we have, is just look at some of the things that Paul had to say about Christ's resurrection. They want answers, so they go to an expert. And Paul is an expert, really, on Jesus Christ and him crucified. He may have been an expert on gardening, for all I know. History doesn't relate. But they write to him because he's an expert on Jesus Christ. The letter begins, call Paul, call to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So he knew what he was talking about when it came to Jesus. And if we want to hear and understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ, well, he's a good person to listen to. Particularly, I think, because he took the message of Jesus to people who weren't Jews didn't know their Bibles, didn't know the backstory, which I think makes him particularly uh, relevant today when most of us, most people, uh, aren't Jews, don't know their Bibles, and don't know the history of God's dealing with Israel. Indeed, there was a letter in the paper, one of the broadsheets this week, you may have seen it, uh, from a freelance tutor. It was, uh, the letter was triggered by the recent debate on sex education in school and what school should include and should not include. And the tutor wrote, the 14-year-old boy whom I tutor every week and who attends a good secondary school told me that he was looking forward to the Easter holidays. I asked him what Easter was. He said he didn't know. And the tutor wondered, uh, in the light of that, whether schools were in fact focusing on the right things. Well, unlike our 14-year-old schoolboy, the Corinthians do know something about Easter. But they needed some things clarifying and reminding of other things. So, chapter 15, verse 1, our reading this morning, it would be helpful to open it, have it open in front of you. Verse 1, Paul writes, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. I once heard advice given to young, young preachers uh, that was don't keep on talking about the gospel, which 
by which I think they meant don't keep using the phrase the gospel because it descends into something of a Christian cliche. Um, what, it, what does the gospel mean? I mean, the common answer is given, is, well, it means good news, but that rather begs the question, doesn't it? News of what and why is it good? In the first century, the word here for gospel actually mean, meant momentous news. A hugely significant announcement. It sort of referred to when kingdoms rose and kingdoms fell, or when someone, a victory in battle. Sort of epoch defining news, momentous news. And the message, the news that Paul had brought to the Corinthians a few years previously was epoch defining. It was news that changed everything. How so? Verse 2. Well, if they grasped hold of it, if they heard it, understood it, trusted and held on to it, they would be saved. From whom? Well, from God, who stood against them for rebellion and wickedness and sin. From his wrath, his judgment. When God is against you, it is momentous news to hear that there's now a way back to a restored relationship with the creator. Sound too good to be true? What is this news? How does it work? Well, he tells them, and us. And Jesus' resurrection will be at the heart of it, as we'll see. And what I want to do is just briefly look at, I think I've got five or six quick things that Paul reminds them of. Firstly, verse 3. He reminds them that this message didn't originate with him. He hadn't sat down and thought it up one day, and nor had anyone else. It was a message he'd received, and his job was to simply pass it on. The message of grace and peace and reconciliation was God's message. It was a message from God, and it was a message about God. And Paul was simply the messenger, sent from God to pass it on to others. And he had passed it on to them, verse 3. But what was this message? Well, the second point, it was a message about Jesus Christ and what had happened to him. You see, it wasn't an idea or a philosophy. It wasn't a, a political program. It wasn't a scheme for self-improvement or an ideal to be striven for. It was news about a person. What about that person? Well, thirdly, it was a news about his death, do you see? And that might seem a little bit odd, really, at first glance, to say that the most important thing about someone was their death. Not how they lived, but how they died. But that's a crucial bit. That death. That he died. And how he died. And what that death meant. And that was the important bit. That was what changed everything. See, at the heart of Paul's message was the death of Jesus Christ. Early in the letter, he puts it like this. In chapter 2, he said, When I came to you, Corinthians, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When Paul summarised his message, it was Christ and him crucified. On Good Friday, Christ died. He was crucified. He died. He was dead. No one stood in for him. There wasn't a swap or a switch for someone else at the last moment. Jesus died. A historically verifiable death in public with witnesses. A death testified to to by ancient and modern historians, Christian and non-Christian alike. Christ died. Death looks very different from swooning or fainting. As anyone who's certified anyone dead knows, you don't confuse the two. His death 
was clear. What was not clear, however, to those there that day looking on, not initially anyway, was what that, de- that that death was purposeful. And that's the fourth point, verse 3. He died for our sins. He died for a reason, for our sins, yours and mine, the sin of the whole world. Rebellion against God cannot just be ignored. There are consequences to actions. When creatures reject their creator, judgment is inevitable. And that judgment is death. We deserve death for our rejection of God as our creator. But the momentous news that Paul brought to the Corinthians, the almost unbelievable news, was that on the cross, Jesus had died for their sin. For ours, for yours, for mine. Jesus in our place, paying the penalty for our rebellion and sin. Well, you might ask, well, what about his own sin? One of the unique things about Jesus is that he didn't have any. He never rebelled against his father's will. He was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And that makes him unique. No one else like him. One of the things that makes him unique. He had no debt to pay. It was said of the late queen, wasn't it, when she was alive, that she never carried any money on her. Uh, 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 because you never had to pay for anything. Well, Jesus didn't have to pay anything for his sin. In fact, one of his enemies, one, one of his, uh, some of his enemies once asked him, or rather he asked those who were kicking against what he was saying, he asked them, which one of you can accuse me of sin? And do you know what the best they could come up with? The best they could come up with was that he spent time with the wrong sort of people. Jesus' sinless, perfect life was the basis of the swap that did occur on the cross, the substitution that did take place. On the cross, he swapped his righteousness for our sin. He took his sin on himself and gifted us his righteousness. He took on his people's guilt so that justice would be done when God declares them not guilty. In his death, he paid the price of our rebellion so that we don't have to. He had not earned a penalty, we had. He died paying the penalty for us. Fifthly, do you see verse 3, that that death was according to the scriptures? All the events of Easter, everything that happened, all that Christ did, all that his death achieved, did not occur in a vacuum but according to the scriptures. Now, some people want evidence that Christianity is true, and the evidence for the truth of Christianity, of the Christian message, is cumulative. Lots of things feed into it. But I think one of the most compelling pieces of evidence, at least to my mind, is that everything Jesus said and did was a fulfillment of the Old Testament. Because scripture here in verse 3 refers to the Old Testament scriptures, doesn't it? And throughout the Old Testament, from the opening chapters through to the, through the account of Abraham and his family, through the history of Israel, through the words of the prophets, God is revealing himself in terms of promises. He tells us what he's going to do. For centuries, God has been preparing Israel for the arrival of their Messiah and what he would do. And the momentous news of the gospel is that the time is at hand. The time of fulfillment has come. The promises are now being fulfilled. Exile ended. Salvation won. In the words of Isaiah, that uh, the book we heard from a few moments ago, as Louise prayed for us, through the wounds of a suffering servant, a king, his people would be healed. He died according to the scriptures. And if we miss the force of this, and I think we often do miss the force of it, it's because we perhaps don't know the Old Testament scriptures as well as we might. Sixthly, verse 4, do you know he was buried? He died a real death, death, and he was buried. He didn't swoon, he didn't faint, he wasn't revived in the cool of a tomb. He died and was buried. 
and was raised. God raised him in a bodily resurrection. Can't have happened, you say. That kind of thing doesn't happen. No, indeed, it doesn't. Yet it did. Can't have happened. Well, you think, if God created all things by his powerful word, including the laws of nature, it really is quite small beer for him to postpone, suspend those laws, should he so choose. And he did, to vindicate his son. Dead men don't rise, you say. No, they don't. Except this one did. And the proof, verse 5, he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, then the twelve, then to a group of 500 men and women. He was seen, heard, touched. He met up and ate with his old friends. Proof, not scientific proof, in the sense that it's something that others can do, uh, at repeat at other times and places. The whole point of Jesus' death and resurrection is it's unique. But proof in the historical sense. There are eyewitnesses, hundreds of them. You could have seen him too, had you been there. You missed it, you weren't there. Okay, well then, go and ask those who were, verse 6. They're still alive, or most of them are. Of course, we can't do that now, because they're all dead, aren't they? But what we can do is listen to their testimony. Read the accounts they left behind of what they did see. We've got the accounts in the four Gospels in the New Testament. If you've never read one, can I encourage you to read one of them? Uh, there are some free copies on the bookstall, ones like that. They're free if you want to take them and read them. They've actually got places where you can write notes and ask questions. And if you'd rather not do that, rather read that through with someone else and chat through what you're reading, then there are plenty of folk here who'd love to do that with you. And if a whole gospel is too daunting, there's these little books. It's 50 pages, 6 millimetres, big font, wouldn't take more than an hour. Three eyewitnesses account from across the gospels. Again, free to take it if you'll read it. But maybe you can't be bothered. Maybe you're here under sufferance this morning. You know, you're here because your family or friends wanted you to be. And you've decided already, oh, it's just fake, it's, it's just a big conspiracy. If so, consider this. Many of those first witnesses would die because they insisted that what they were saying was true that Jesus had been raised. Now, it's perfectly true that people will die for all sorts of mad ideas and things. Uh, the nonsense that they've convinced themselves about, that's perfectly true. But ask yourself this. Do people die willingly for something they know to be false? Chuck Colson, uh, some of you know, know, he was in the Nixon White House at the time of Watergate. Uh, shortly after uh, Watergate, uh, he actually became a Christian and he wrote an account of his conversion and of the events of the Watergate scandal in a book called Born Again. In it, he said this, quote, I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned and put in prison. They would not have endured if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep the lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a life 40 years, absolutely impossible. Well, some folk in Corinth were struggling with the idea of the dead being raised, verse 12. Paul knew that Jesus had been raised, he'd met him, verse 8, and therefore he knew the truth of the Christian message. That hadn't always been the case, of course, if you know Paul's story. He, uh, at one time, he was virulently opposed to it, he he tried to stamp out this new movement, as he reminds him in verse 9. 
But he'd been brought to the realization that he was wrong. Not easy for a man in his position, I think, to admit. Not easy for anyone to admit that they'd been wrong. And perhaps the older it is, the harder it is, I don't know. To acknowledge that you got things so profoundly wrong and need to change. But faced with the undeniable fact of Christ's resurrection, Paul was changed. Now, the question the Corinthians had was, was slightly different to the ones we often have. Our question is often, did Christ really rise? Their question concerned actually the resurrection of believers, when and how that would happen, and the implications of the answers to that question for them in Corinth. And I don't want to get embroiled in the details of that discussion. It's an important one, but I'll leave that for another time. What I want to note, just as we close, to underline how that in Paul's answer, the resurrection of Christ is absolutely central to the Christian message. So verse 13, just glance down. He says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised... Your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Jesus' non-resurrection would cause the whole thing to collapse as a pack of cards. No forgiveness, no salvation, no redemption, no future, no hope if Jesus is still dead and buried. It would mean Jesus is a liar because he says several times in the gospel that's exactly what he's going to do. It means all the apostles are liars, verse 15. They'd have given false testimony about God. It would mean they and everyone is still in their sins and it would mean their faith is futile and their hope useless. If Jesus has not been raised, then of all people on earth, Christians who live with this false hope are more to be pitied than anyone else. But the good news the momentous news that Paul wanted the whole world to hear, verse 20, Christ has indeed been raised. Well, it's my hope and prayer that with this morning that all of us might come to see, as Paul did, that Christ was risen, to rejoice in that, to hold firmly to it, and to come to share with him and all believers across the world the salvation and new life that that brings. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you did indeed raise Christ from the dead. Thank you that he is vindicated and that his work was effective and is done. That the price has been paid. Redemption has been won. And we can know you and the eternal life that knowing you brings. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.